Chapman book for my lover. The dedication. An episode of language which accompanies any amorous gift, whether real or projected, and more generally every gesture, whether actual or interior, by which the subject dedicates something to the loved one. Roland Barth, A Lover's Discourse. For PB, who doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> then again, if you're reading this, you probably do. Prologue. To strip, you must first wear your sins like clothes. This act of dressing demands a scholarly acquaintance with guilt and nakedness and an obsession with redemption. Eve, too, was initiated into the kingdom of Strip when she first ate the forbidden fruit and experienced an aftertaste of shame. Adam participated and for the first time understood what it meant to dress and undress. And their eyes were open, the book of Genesis tells us, and they were conscious that they had no clothing and they made themselves coats of leaves stitched together from them, we inherited the act of stripping. To strip, you must contend with shame. You must learn to make too much of dust. Take your time with revelation. Too much, too soon, and the epiphany of naked flesh will be irrevocably lost. Stripping is a function of movement. Do not unravel in chronological order. Do not be distracted by time. Do not worry about sequence. There is no law that dictates what to undo first. To start with the topmost button and make your way down to the last indicates a grievous lack of imagination. To strip is to confess, to lay bare, to expose yourself to a pair of possibly unforgiving eyes. There is no beginning and no obvious end. Beneath the veneer of clothes is not just the naked body, but a universe of skin and scars and the memory of touch. To strip, you need an audience. A single voyeur will do. Come in, sit down. Keep your hands firmly on either side of your chair. Sure, you may smoke a cigarette, even pour yourself a glass of single malt if you like. There's something I'd like to show you, something I'd like you to see. I know you've witnessed it all before, but this time it's different. This time I'm going to strip while you watch. As I undo each layer, I'll make my little confessions about things I ought to have told you, things you ought to have known. We cannot proceed with the contents of this handbook until we've stepped across this line. I've never done this before, but I've been practicing. There are new things I've learned to do with my fingers, new tricks I've learned to do with my waist, new movements I've learned to make with my body, but I've yet to learn how to titillate. I shall strip to my almost core, except I'll keep that diamond on my nipple and that ruby on my cunt. You shouldn't see too much. I first undo the straps of my sandals. My feet make contact with marble. A few months ago, after several glasses of Lafroig and the feast I made that we consumed, you returned to your study to work. I stacked the used plates in the sink, turned on some jazz, then proceeded to wash the dishes. It's become a habit cleaning your kitchen after we're both done eating. I was ravenously happy. I'd cook goan sausages with strips of onion and potatoes and a hint of tamarind juice and had stir-fried beans on the side with crushed pepper, burnt garlic and a slice of salt. You'd licked your fingers in delight. You were ravenously happy too. And right before you walked into your study had even thanked me for having sated your appetite. As I soaped and scrubbed each plate, 
I sang along to Nina Simone singing Just in Time. I was inebriated by you, by vinegar, by single malt. Sometime between Nina mouthing, I was lost, and the losing dice were tossed. A quarter plate slipped from my fingers and gravitated towards the floor. It took a while to register. By the time I did, the single unit that was the quarter plate had split into five. It was irrevocable. Your kitchen felt like a crime scene. I bent over and picked up every scrap of evidence and I scanned the floor for fingerprints that could trace the incident back to me. Then I washed my hands with soap, pulled out the comics page from the newspaper and used it to wrap the broken bits. I placed this little package in my bag, then searched for the scrubber that had fallen too. I continued with the dishwashing while battling with syntax. I didn't break the plate, the plate broke itself. I was an innocent bystander. For days I was saddled with, gr with guilt. I knew how attached you were to your kitchen things, most of which were older than I was. I stashed the dismembered corpse of the broken plate in a drawer in my house, hoping it might collect itself and reincarnate as a spoon or a tea strainer or a butter knife, as anything that could be returned to you. Weeks later, the guilt dissipated, leaving behind a vindictive smirk. I felt strangely satisfied with myself. The plate was no ordinary casualty. It was the victim of my revenge for all those times you manhandled my heart, all the times you almost broke me. I carefully disguised its absence by serving breakfast in dinner plates instead. I was surprised you didn't notice. One day you might, and I may not be around to plead guilty to this crime. Yes, I broke your plate. I take off my earrings. My body is now unadorned. When I was a young girl, my parents made too much of broken things. I learned to fear the sounds of breaking, waves crack, cracking against each other and falling apart over the shore, post-pubescent boys and the hoarseness of their voices, wind galloping against trees, swishing and swooshing, as somewhere in the distance clouds tumble against clouds and rumbled with an unceasing, cacophonous laughter, sheets of glass that contained within each atom the sureness of shattering. My mother, too, was afraid of broken things and would lock the cutlery in the kitchen cupboard to be exhibited on special occasions. We ate in melamine plates and drank in cheap glasses. Any unintentional transgression with anything fragile was met with severe punishment. Lashes of my father's belt or the snare of my mother's tongue. I learned to hide my sins, bury them under the mattress, stash them in the backyard of my cupboard, sweep them outside the house. I learned to disassociate myself from fragments formed by lapses. Over time, the secrets piled up. The crimes didn't go unnoticed, but I learned to deny any involvement. I learned most of all that nothing, not even the toughest fortress that surrounds the most indestructible heart, is unbreakable. My fingers slither along my back in search of hooks, only to realize there's no bra to undo. So they loiter around the front and unhook my blouse. I cover my breasts with the bordered edge of my sari. The palm of my right hand encases my left breast. I can feel my pulse. I was 11 years old the first time I got my heart broken. I've learned nothing from that experience. I continue to expose it to too much sunlight and let it roam naked at night. There is some small memory of agony preserved in some dark corner of my skull. I need torchlight to arrive at it. You could say I was possibly too young to know, too young to remember. 
I was, however, young enough to know what it felt like to hand my heart on a platter to someone who claimed to want it and then have it returned to me, used and half-discarded, faded and dog-eared. Never again, I decided. Except a year later, he borrowed it again. This time, I had it bubble-wrapped and insulated from within. Sometimes, between my giving and his discarding of my offering, I sought refuge in words. I learned to listen with my eyes and speak with my fingers. I learned to surrender uncompromisingly to the moment, to let the words dictate my actions. No harm could come to me as long as I had my tongue, as long as words raged through my blood, as long as I had the venom of language at my disposal. I got my heart broken when I was 11 years old. I cried in secret, wrote poems in hiding, and stashed the broken pieces in a diary I've long since burned. I unravel my hair and take a few steps towards you so that I'm now at arm's length. I look at you self-consciously, as if you were a mirror. On the wall outside my bed hangs a black and white photograph of you. It's a cutout from a magazine. It isn't larger than the size of my palm, and yet you seem to leap out of the invisible frame. This is the image I often wake up to, you seated casually on a cane chair, your hands wielding a digital camera as if brandishing a weapon, your eyes intense, your gaze focused, the lens level with your forehead, the stub of a cigarette dangling between the first and three fingers of your left hand. I've placed you at vantage point. From where I lie, immersed in dreams, it would seem as though you're looking down at me, framing me, watching my every move as the morning light stretches across my skin to illuminate my contours. I wish you'd look at me as purposefully, seek me out with your lens, frame me within the confines of your vision, and leave me fixed in your gaze. I want you to covet me with a single look, I want you to possess me with the purity of your appetite. I want this image I have of you taped to my wall to become flesh. I want you to watch over my body being intoxicated by dreams. I want you to ache to be inside it, to be one with your subject.